good old time Have a fun time with two bros We're having a good time, never a bad time Having a fun time, never a dumb time Down on the bed been, you've been singing about Rastafarians a lot lately. Mm-hmm. Why? Why? I don't know. <laughs> uh, because Rastafarians are, are people too and they deserve to be s- sung about? Heralded? Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. I suppose so. They're all, but they're doing super, they're doing supernatural things. They're like flying through space and stuff. Uh, oh, oh your, your Rastafarians, your version of Rastafarians are. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. I get it. Um, yip And I think that's just a variation of yip <laughs> <laughs> Yes. From Dune. From Dune, yeah. From Dune, yeah. Gosh, Dune. 2020, uh, I have a funny feeling that maybe Dune is going to be coming, making a comeback. Making a comeback. You mean, uh, well, yeah. As, as a movie. As a... Yeah. As a, as a hidden classic. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think it's just your feeling. I think it's, I think it's a, it's a known thing, right? Fantastic. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is. They're remaking Dune. Oh, oh, I, 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 did, I didn't know that. <laughs> you didn't? I just assumed they were going to bring back, uh, yeah, you know, David Lynch's version of Dune. For no, 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 for no, no reason. Dennis. Dennis Villeneuve of, of, uh, um, well, he's made lots of movies, but, uh, Blade Runner 20, 24, whatever it is, wow. <clears throat> is doing wow. it. Well, I'll be damned. I yeah. hope it's good. Uh, Timothée Chalamet is Paul Atreides. <laughs> wow. That fits. Zendaya is in it. Jason hey. Momoa is in it. Stellan Skarsgård, Oscar Isaac. Dave wow. Bautista, Jeez. Josh Brolin, Javier Bardem. Oh, yeah, a cast of Charlotte Rampling. Oh, yeah. well, anyway. damn it, Charlotte. Uh, Is that what the band Good Charlotte was about? Maybe. <laughs> They'd be interesting if they were. They would. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well. Otherwise, boring. Boring. That's the first boring of 2020, eh, brother? Oh, good, good Charlotte. I think that was the boring of 2006. <laughs> yeah, 20, 2006. <laughs> oh, good. I, I good Charlotte was a band. 2006. I, I, um, we were watching a Netflix, uh, stand up with, uh, Tiffany Haddish yesterday. And she said, Tiffany Haddish is, this sassy comedian, black, wrote a autobiography. And it talks about sort of coming up from nowhere. And she's very, very, very funny. She's very lively and funny. You probably, she's sort of, it's kind of inspiring. She kind of, I actually don't know how she has gotten to where she is. She works extremely hard. And she just, you know, movies and TV and just kind of does everything and tells funny stories about hanging out with Will Smith back in the day. And, you know, she's just kind of like, she's just a character. She's a character, a human character, living. I think character. I recognize her. I think mm-hmm. I recognize her. I'm yeah. looking at pictures on yeah. the inter- internet. I'm mm-hmm. trying to see what about what I've seen her in. She stands yeah, out. Well, she stands out know. in most situations because she's very, she doesn't really give AF. She just kind of just that's her whole thing she's very you know uh, uh, not and she's never appropriate okay so, yeah anyway okay. so well, the, cool it's like uh, yeah so anyway so she was talking but, in her stand up she was talking about uh, oh yeah that happened in the 1900s that happened in the late 1900s and we thought that was just hilarious because I haven't heard that yet but it's uh, completely yeah, true you know, yeah, something happened yeah. during the 90s. Instead of saying the 90s, she's like, you know, yeah. the, the late 1900s. <laughs> it's right, like, that's funny. It takes on a totally different, you know, context, but it's really... The late 20th century. That's so funny. Yeah, well, 
We yeah. old. Yeah. We getting old. Yes. old. Don't give a whole bunch. A whole uh, bunch. Okay. Anyway, hi brother. Welcome to hey, brother. the new year. Welcome to the uh, the, new decade. the decade of the twenties. It's a new decade. It's a finally we're able to say something that feels right, like the twenties, instead of the aughts or the teens or the yeah millennial yeah millennium. I know this 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 millenn this millennium has just begun. Yes, finally, because now we can count it. We survived because right. now we can yeah. now we can actually make it sound s sexy. Yeah. So, what, what, so, you know, if the 1920s were the roaring 20s, mm -hmm. what, a, what is, um, you know, I come to think of it, that's the only, <laughs> it's the only decade in the 20th century that I can think of offhand of being identified as the roaring 20s. Mm -hmm. I mean, what were the 30s? Tragic and, 30s? Uh, the, well, yeah, I mean, the they? boring 30s because of <laughs> uh, prohibition. Yeah. Um, and then, and then, you know, but I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like they don't uh -huh. have a name. I mean, they were certainly the, everyone, every decade had its landmarks of whether it's war or, you know, whatever the things that it's identified with. But I it just, it just occurred to me, oh yeah, there's no other decade that I can think of. Well, the eighties, uh, big eighties, don't they usually call it the big eighties? Cause don't everything was big. Oh, okay. Don't they? Well, that would fit. Seventies, the nasty seventies. <laughs> <laughs> Where everybody had hair and yeah. disease. And Hairs, disease. hair and acid. Hair and ass. <laughs> hair, ass, and drugs. Uh, yeah, uh, you're right. The tw Roaring Twenties, the, 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 these 20s shall be known as the meh. The, man, the boring 20s? <laughs> no, I hope it's going to be anything but boring. I hope it's... The hope flooring 20s. The, the, yeah. <laughs> I, you know, honestly, I, I haven't given it. <laughs> Ew. Is that something bad? Sorry. No. Torpid. The torpid the 20s. The torpid 20s. There we go. Um, <clears throat> I haven't really given a whole lot of thought to, uh, nor watched other people's thoughts on comparing these 20s to 20s 100 years ago um, and what the, you know, political similarities and differences are and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, kind of where we are now compared to where we were then. Yeah. Um, I haven't really thought about it. I've been, I've been very inwardly focused the past uh, couple of weeks of this year, yeah. this decade. Yeah, me too. Um, and uh, trying to, trying to make my life better. That's yeah. my, that's, I, I don't, I don't know about you. I don't do, um, uh, resolutions. Right. And I, I'm not like, uh, I, I don't dislike resolutions. I just, I've never, and this, it's kind of, I feel like it stems from the same place. Uh, I don't keep a journal really. And I never have, I've never been a diary type of person. So, uh, that, so it's not like I'm, I'm cool because I don't do resolutions. <laughs> it's just something I've never really done. Yeah. And, but, but I have found myself this year, wanting to focus on some things that I have known that I would probably make my life better or not even probably would, would improve my life if I started practicing them, but I've just never done it. Yeah. So I've, this, uh, I've started off this year. Um, I think we, you know, you and I've talked about doing the, the, uh, morning miracle, miracle morning, the yes. miracle morning, um, of which, um, I've been a little, I haven't been super consistent with yet. Um, we'll talk about what that is in a second, but, uh -huh. but one thing that I have been more consistent with is meditating, which uh -huh. is something I've just flirted with very briefly, never worked up to a practice, never kept it as a consistent part of my life. But I've, I've, in the past couple of weeks, I've really enjoyed it a lot. And, um, and it, it just feels like it's past, it's past time for that to be a part of my life. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm with you. I, I, uh, I it, it's it's funny because you and I spent the <laughs> we spent the the last half of the of uh, the the last decade decade of the 1900s with a guy that that was into meditating long before most people I know. Uh, oh yeah, our friend Ward Williams, who who was very mm -hmm. sort of. 
very good at, you know, sort of a daily practice of meditating and, and I would try it and just not ever have the patience for it. And I know it's that scary. It's, it, it's intimidating. It's intimidating. It's, it's difficult. It's uncomfortable. It's, you know, and it's, it, there's a lot of, a lot of things to it. And I know that it's sort of become a, uh, it, it's much more in the public eye than it used to be. Certainly w- when Ward was, you know, making yeah. it a practice. And so there's a lot more, um, materials that help there's a lot more uh there's a lot more things to like, there's apps there's books to read you know right. b- your celebrities are making a big deal out of it so it is yeah. both easier to sort of get going which i think is is really great but it doesn't make it any any actually make it any easier and i i applaud you it has been sort of part of my life for the last few years but i i i am not i, I would say i'm consistent for me, which means, uh, you know, an average of two or three times a week for, for the last, you know, few, uh, few years, but I'm with you. It's, it really, it really starts kicking in when you, when you try every day, when you try to just sit down and, and listen to your breath every day. It's just a very different thing. Uh, mm-hmm. it is, I, I'm excited to hear your journey about it because I don't talk about it that often. Uh, it is, you know, like every, every sort of spiritual thing for me, it's, it's super personal and I'm not, I'm not really, I always get a little <laughs> slightly embarrassed to be on a bandwagon. Also, we are, mm. you know, we're also Gen X, so we're, we're, yeah. we're usually embarrassed by, cynical. It, yeah, we're <laughs> cynical and embarrassed by anything that's like self-help or anything because that just wasn't yeah. what we did. Uh, so it, it's, it's good to talk about it, and I, but I'm m- mostly on a scientific level interested in, in what you learn and how, how it goes for you. you Thanks. Share. Yeah. Well, I've, I've, I've certainly was inspired by Ward over yeah. the years and, and I, I didn't, you know, I didn't necessarily know what the what benefits Ward was getting out of this. I knew that he was very diligent in his practice. I mean, I lived with Ward for a long time, so I saw him every day, you know, and he had his, uh, I don't know, what do you call that bowl with the the singing bowl? or Singing the, bowl, yeah, people call it. So it's called. Yeah. Um, he had that, you know, he has the whole thing and the mat, the, 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 the pillow to sit on and the pillow for your pillow to sit on. <laughs> he, had, he had everything he needed. And, um, but I, Ward is such a, uh, traditionally, I mean, he's such an even keel guy for the most part. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. you know, I think having kids in life for anybody kind of turns everything upside down. So maybe in, in recent years, you know, he's been, and he, I know he's, hasn't been meditating as much cause he, he you know, he hasn't had time to. Mm-hmm. So maybe that's changed, but I didn't necessarily look at him and go, Oh, I can see clearly how this is helping his day to day. Right. Yeah. Cause he just, Ward was always just kind of chill for the most part, except, except about girls. He wasn't chill about girls. <laughs> um, but, and then, and then, you know, years later you would talk about how much it had helped you and your kind of struggles with, um, depression or anxiety and, and all of those kind of inner focus. demons that we all yeah. deal with and focus. Um, but I didn't, at that point, I don't, you know, we weren't living together in the same apartment as much right. anymore. So I heard you talk about it, but I didn't necessarily see it. Um, you know, I think some of the, the most significant changes that I saw in you were really after, um, you know, you were with Lindsay. And so I really attributed a lot of those changes to her and her influence and, and how kind of Zen she seems to be as yeah. just as a natural state yes. human being. Sure. Um, and that seemed to rub off on you. Where I really started to see it um, in action was um, kind of watching Elise put it into play. Mm. Um, it's been a big part of her life now for a minute and uh, really, really has has been kind of incredible um, as part of her 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 specific journey. So because yeah. that, that, that I get to witness every single day. Right. Right. So I, I know that much more intimately anyways, it's, it's something that I felt like I just, well, not even I felt it's something that I knew that I, I should be doing yeah. and I just been putting it off or scared to do, or didn't, you know, didn't make a practice or find time. And this time I said, you know what, I'm just gonna, at least already has it. She's already inspired me to do it. I'm just going to do it just like, 
I finally, you know, I floss my teeth now every day, like an adult, <laughs> uh, yes. right? Yeah. And, and so it's just that kind of thing. But it's come at a time where kind of looking back at the last year and the last decade, or even really just the last month, um, it's, it's been very fresh on my mind because, uh, you know, we just did this jump tour and, uh, I literally, I guess we played two shows in the, in May or something in 2019. Yes. But other than that, I, I, you know, I don't live in a place where I can practice. I don't have a practice space anymore. Um, I didn't even have my practice pad at my apartment for most of the year. It wasn't uh, until, you know, leading up, you know, like the month before the tour that I really went and got my practice pad. That's the most I can do. I can't, I just don't, I can never play the drum set. So I had ostensibly, I'd not touched an instrument in a year and, um, I wasn't super worried about it, but what I was surprised by was that I was surprised to feel like I was performing better than I really ever had. Um, and definitely if not better than I had, at least more consistently from show to show. Um, oftentimes I get the feeling from show to show, like one will be really high. The next one I feel like, Oh, I really sucked. Or, you know, you'll kind of obsess over one thing that you did incorrectly or dropped or didn't, you know, or you maybe your head is somewhere else and you just get really down about it. And it just, whether or not the audience perceives it as being, you know, consistent or not consistent from show to show matters less than how you perceive it. I don't know. I've, we've never actually talked about you know, how you perceive yourself from show to show. But with, with drums, um, it's just always, you know, it's, it's always been traditionally very easy for me to go, Oh, that show was awesome. Right. And then the next night, Oh, that sucked. Yeah. And, and on this past tour, I, I really, from every night I got off stage and I was like, yeah, that felt good. That yeah. felt really good. And, and I, we've talked about this off, off podcast, off camera, off mic, um, already just about this idea that, um, you know, we don't know what's happening with jump this year and, uh, in 2018, uh, Sparrow came out and we, uh, you know, there was a lot of those feelings of stakes, like, like back in the, the old days, <laughs> not necessarily the good old days, <laughs> right. right. <laughs> um, where, uh, you know, all of a sudden it felt like, Hmm, are we reaching for the brass ring again? What does that mean? Was that, uh, you know, there was a minute where I, I didn't know what the lifespan of Sparrow was really going to look like for a band of 40 something year old guys, like what we would expect. But I allowed myself emotionally to kind of go, Hmm, maybe this is going to be our big break. <laughs> right. And, right. and so the stakes, the stakes in 2018 all of a sudden became very inflated. And I felt like I, I performed and I'm, I'm speaking specifically about my physical performance, but I feel like I, and I felt good about what I did in 2018, but I still had that sense of the stakes were so high mm. and, you know, everything was really emotionally charged. And anyway, looking forward to 2020, you know, we just didn't know, we don't know what's happening this year. Uh, Sparrow is, it's a year later, you know, we don't know what's happening with that either. Nothing mattered as much, right? right? So without those stakes, I just got on stage every night and I, that was, I just got out of my own way yeah. is, essentially is what happened. And I know this is really long. I'll, I'll promise I'll wrap this up, but, um, it just, it, after the tour was over, it reminded me of, of a guy who I saw speak once at the college of Charleston. His name is Kenny Werner. He wrote a book called effortless mastery, essentially about getting out of your own way. Um, uh, but what I, I started reading it as part of my, uh, miracle morning. Um, and it has to do surprisingly, it has to do more with meditation than I had realized, oh. but essentially, hmm. yeah, uh, essentially the, for those of you who never heard of it, the idea is if you, the less you care about something and this sounds bad, but just stick with me, the less you care about something as a player, um, like the less stakes you have in a gig, like say you're playing a gig at the the whiskey loser, <laughs> whatever, <laughs> but it's, it, it's jam packed and all the industry guys are there and you're like, Oh my God, there's so much resting on this gig. And you, and you're so inside your own head that you're, you're going to completely choke up. Um, and, uh, then the next night you play at the, the, the 
te tequila <laughs> loser and there's nobody there and you don't give a hoot and all of a sudden you're playing and it's just flowing out of you and it feels like magic. Right. Um, so trying to recreate that, that, that latter idea all the time. But what's interesting getting into this book is that it's, it's aligning with my thoughts on meditation much more so than I thought they would. Anyway, I'm sorry that was super long. No. We could definitely edit, we could edit this down so that I don't <laughs> sound like a completely self-focused piece of <laughs> shit. <laughs> Your new motto for 2020. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, everything you said. But do you, but let me ask you, do yeah. do you have that experience from from night to night? Cuz that's not something for those of you, you know, who don't who who know the band Jump. Um, we don't necessarily come off stage and be and say like, great show. I really love that accordion lick that you did. We don't really discuss each other's performances that much, mm -mm. Uh, you know, outside of like, Hey, good show tonight. Right. Um, we just don't, it doesn't really happen, you yeah. know? So I don't, I don't really know. Like when you come off stage outside of like, if I know if you're having gremlins and ghosts in the machine and I can see your frustration on stage, which right. happens from time to time. Sure. Uh, then I know it's like you've had a, a kind of a lame show, but otherwise what's it like for you? Well, yeah, the, the I think that you, you're kind of hitting on some things for sure. For me, it's, it's less about the effortless mastery is not so much about the, um, the venue or the or the stakes for Sparrow, it's more the mastery over my own mind. Meaning, I I just I think in some ways I care less, and I and I get out of my way more, so that the the highs may not be quite as high, but the lows are definitely not as low either. Mm -hmm. That uh, you know, performance to performance, I I try to. I have, you know, from 2005 to 2015, I had 10 years of acting training to, to lean on uh, in 2015 and, and, and until now, which is very, I didn't expect it to help me as much as it does, both improv and then just sort of experience being on stage uh, reciting scripts. But that really, uh, that really has been an amazing thing to draw on where I don't feel like I had a technique before and I'm talking about more more my my performance as far as the the songs that I'm performing but uh, like that I'm speaking but also also just playing music and being being more focused now than I have ever been able to be and uh, you know when it's time for me to put my attention outward I can. And that that I try to make new every day. I try to I try to to sort of tweak it to to feel like I'm in the moment talking about <laughs> your body parts or whatever. Like I'm really trying to to feel that. So that's helpful on that level, but then yes, on the other level I'd say honestly, well, I mean this this kind of might be to your point, but but something like meditation allowing me to be also in the moment, which which is really, I think, my my kryptonite and really probably anybody who has uh, ADHD. That's a very difficult thing. The the attention. Mm. Um, again, I, I've I've said this before, but I, I don't think it's a deficit. In fact, I don't know why it's called attention. De there's the problem is it's too much attention. There's there's mm. no deficit going on. It's it's a lack right. of focus. It's a it's a it's an inability to to hold on to the attention that you need to hold on to to get from A to B. And so that mm. that I know I have done. I have gotten better at. I know that I have uh, relaxed into. Uh, you might be interested in this book. Yeah. You might be interested in it. I mean, he, he, first of all, I will say, I, I don't, I don't love the writing. Sure. Uh, and the, 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 it's, it's a pretty old book at this point and it's some dated, got some dated ideas. Yeah. Um, and he talks about how TV is a, is the scourge. <laughs> Television is the scourge. I'm like, wow. Well, okay. Is. Right. <laughs> <laughs> TV is like a respite from the internet at this point. <clears throat> Take a break from the internet kids. Watch some TV. Um, 
But he definitely talks about how he he's a so Kenny Werner is a jazz pianist if you didn't know, right? Um, I knew and the pianist. yeah, and uh, he talks about a lot of his problems coming up as a kid were had to do with his attention and his ability to practice, and he never practiced. He couldn't figure out. He couldn't figure out how to motivate himself to find the focus to practice. He, at this point he, in the book, as far as I've gotten, he hasn't actually di been diagnosed as ADD or ADHD. I'm not sure if <laughs> that was really a thing back yeah. when he wrote this book. Probably not. But he couldn't – all of his self-worth was tied up in being a pianist because he wasn't good at anything else, You know, wasn't athletic, wasn't good looking, <clears throat> wasn't good in school. But he was just naturally good at piano, and so that kind of became his identity. But every time he either saw in person or even listened to a pianist better than him, it was like emotionally crippling, um, which was just sounds so rough. Um, That's terrible. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but he – anyway, he talks a lot about meditation and being in the moment and learning how – how he found the attention span to practice. Like, it, you know, studying with people who showed him, a, you know, here's how you, and not saying here, I'm going to show you how to practice for someone who can't focus, but without saying that basically did that say, okay, forget everything you did practice, do this for five minutes a day. And that's okay. all you're going to do for two weeks. Right. Um, and, and then six days into his two week journey, he, and he's not supposed to play anything at all. Other than that, right? Just nothing. Just do this one thing with each hand, five minutes a day. And then he ends up playing a gig six days in and he blows his own mind because all of a sudden he's just like you do try to do in meditation where you're observing your breath, you're observing yourself just as a being. He was observing his own playing, like kind of almost an out-of-body experience. So Anyway, I, I wouldn't say that I experienced anything on that level as a performer on the past tour, but um, but I did discover something that I want to try to apply to as many aspects of my life as I can, which is if we can remove the stakes, if I can get out of my own way as a designer, as a yeah. businessman, yes. um, as a husband, um, uh, in, in one particularly big space in my life, maybe the most important space, which is I spent a lot of 2018 and 2019 very focused on fitness and nutrition and going about going on a very specific journey that looking back now, um, I don't regret anything that I did, but I wouldn't call it healthy either. Mm -hmm. uh, and removing the stakes, like the, the stakes <laughs> from what I've been kind of trying to achieve, the goals that I have were so high and felt like if I veered off my little narrow road, everything was going to fail, crash and burn, and I would never reach my goal. And I just continue to be frustrated. And uh, anyway, lots of places in life to kind of apply this idea of, of lowering the stakes and getting out of your way and anyway, I hope that meditation meditation will be a part of that. It sounds like for you, and your musical experience anyway, uh, it it is a part of your life. Do do you did you, were you meditating just this past month on the road? Did you find that it specifically helped you, um, just in these past shows? I think so. Yeah. I I mean, it, I can. <clears throat> again, I'm not. I'm not pretending or or implying that I'm super great at it or or consistent, but. I, I feel like I can pretty solidly tell the difference in days, uh, day to day when I do take that time and when I don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and it, so we mentioned earlier this, we won't get, we won't go down this path too, too far, but, uh, we did mention this book, the miracle morning by Hal Elrod. And, and it's something that Elise actually has turned both of us on to. Uh, and I, I read the book. It's uh, talk, Speaking of books that, you know, the writing doesn't necessarily inspire me. It doesn't, it doesn't really inspire me that much. But what is, but it is, it is very short. So it's worth, it's worth picking up. And the, the, the main thing about the Miracle Morning, which what is the, what is the 
the not so obvious secret guaranteed to transform your life before 8 a.m. So the again, like it's hey, hey, hey you know, <laughs> very self-help, you know, thing. But mm-hmm. at the same time, he really has hit on something that uh, is is something that I struggle with the most, which is give yourself that time. Allow mm. that. That is that is a gift to you. Which, if you start thinking of meditation as something that is, you know, a journey or you know something like that, uh, you know, something to overcome or something to get through in the day, then yes, it's going to be very hard for you to start a practice. But man, if you can if you can actually allow um, yourself the you know, six minutes, 30 minutes, hour to do this, this miracle morning thing, which in his book includes, uh, meditating, affirmations, visualization, exercise, reading, and writing. Uh, none of those things, not one of those things aren't things that we've all done and, and think, know that are very good for us. It's just that the the concept of, of doing them first thing in the morning giving yourself that time and like letting it be your special time where you don't have to be distracted, where no one's writing you, where no one is again, not an original thought. I mean, the masters mm-hmm. of, of, of history, the, the greatest artists in history have lived this way, lived this way. You know, it's like, it's nothing new. A lot of them. Yeah. Uh, they, but, there's yeah. something magical about this, that early morning hour where, yeah. a lot Yeah. Of- but he, yeah. he, he kind of puts it down in a very popular, easy to digest way. It makes sense. And man, that's so that's the difference that, that was the point of what I was saying was that is that when I say, oh man, <laughs> I sure do like meditating. I like the way that it 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 makes me feel. I like the additional focus that it adds to my day. I like the sort of there is a secret superpower that you do you do end up getting when, when you, when you're, while you're in a routine, like I, I suffer from road rage, (laughs) (laughs) lots of rage, actually, you know, you and I've talked about our rage period, but like, I, I know when I've, when my practice is, is kind of on, you know, is on point when I can get into a car and I can get to that place and I can go, I can sort of t- use those little magical powers that meditation d- gives you, you know. I'm not saying it makes you a peaceful person or doesn't, you know, make me angry. That's not the case. I'm still angry. It's just it's a different way of looking at the anger. And that's what's so cool about these things. But yeah, I think to answer your question, it it is about allowing yourself d- to to do it, saying mm-hmm. this is good for you. Just just uh, Yeah. Yeah. Don't don't stress yeah. out. Don't beat yourself up. Don't do anything like right. that. Just, but when you do right. do it, guess what? It's pretty cool. I, I've been I've been wading into it, you know, taking it very slow. Um, and I find the, the parts of it that I'm enjoying the most are the meditating, um, a little bit of exercise that feels like just kind of jump starts my system. Yeah. Um, right away in the day, um, I like thinking about the affirmations, um, and you know, you're, you're, you're supposed to write down, uh, just a handful of things, you know, uh, what, what are they, what something you like about yourself, what your intention is for the day, uh, for something to let go of and what you're grateful for. Grateful for yeah. And, um, and so I like just being, I, I go through those things very quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't spend a ton of time and, you're, and apparently, you know, you're, the idea is you can spend as much or as little time on it as you want to. And yeah, anyway, so it's, it's, I, I, I'm doing all that. I, I haven't used it as a tool to like, oh yeah, now I'm going to get up and I'm going to start drawing on my comic right. and, you know, to really start harnessing it that way. Um, I'm just, my body's honestly still not real super transitioned from last month. Mm-hmm. So I'm still sleeping a lot more than I typically do. <laughs> yeah. Um, which is good. I'm, I think it's just, great. Anyways. So that's. That's something new for 2020. Well, I approve. This decade. I approve of that. I approve of your, of your goal. Your okay, your non your non um, uh, resolution. I like it. <laughs> thanks. Um, so this is our 2019. 2019 year in review episode. And the funny thing is, yeah, that we we've only 
this is really the only what the eighth episode of the Biv Bros show colon the, the podcast. So it's mm-hmm. not like we're reviewing a ton of things that we've personally talked about. And there are uh, pe- people out there that are definitely more involved and and would have more to say about things. But I just thought we would, you know, start this. We I think you've you've already talked about something that you're 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 into and your goals. But there's probably things that that have been fun when we look back on 2019 that we enjoyed that we could speak of for the next you know 20 minutes or so. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I know. We didn't I didn't I didn't put any thought into this. <laughs> <laughs> Me neither. Um Me neither. Uh, and, and into 2019 in terms of uh Bibbins Brothers and what we've been doing with this uh initially YouTube and then podcast. Yeah. But um you know, it was a learning thing. It was a, it was experimental. It started off with uh, the Jump Little Children Patreon, and you know, it was kind of a, a feature of that. And then we discovered, oh, nobody really cares. So, <laughs> so we said, well, let's keep doing it, but we'll just do it on our own and out from underneath the umbrella of Jump Little Children, because, yeah. you know, how much jump do we can we slash do we want to talk about? Right. Not ultimately, not that much. Ultimately, um, not necessary to talk about it that much. It just really isn't. It just right. really isn't. Who cares? Um, but we so, learned, yeah. But we learned a lot, and and I don't. Mm-hmm. So my uh, honestly, my my filming days uh, have in some ways just begun because I I learned so much about making videos, editing them, and I and I have a lot of those to make and for for caption point for my other one of my other jobs. But I I don't want I don't think we are saying goodbye to Biv Bros show. Uh, film either, but we, I am very, very proud of us because <laughs> this is somewhat unlike us to to have really been able to do eight now at eight episodes of Bivero Show the podcast. Yes, and in the in the grand scheme of things in the world, uh, it's we're babies, but mm-hmm. you know this is something we've stuck. I've I've done. I'm I'm really. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't do too much work on this podcast, which is good for me. It's good because I think that the one, one thing that I need to learn in my life is to be able to do something good enough, let it go, do something again, do something new. Like that's really mm-hmm. something that's very, very difficult for me because I tweak and I try to make perfect. And uh, the, the important thing is for, for us to have this topical thing that we love to talk about nerdy things and, and then just to sort of get it out there, and I can't delay on something like that. So this has been a really good, uh, this has been a really good practice for me. This this podcast. So I'm glad for the, the you know maybe the five people now that are listening to it that are still there. <laughs> and we're sorry thanks, for taking. People. Yeah, thanks, people. We took a month off. Ironically, we, we couldn't do the podcast while we were together. That's weird. right. I think every time we get on the road, every time we go on tour, we think, oh, we're gonna have so much time to. I, I need, just need to let that go. There's no time. so many opportunities, but there's there's, there's yeah. Time. When you're doing something like that, there's especially when you're 11 people on a a rolling in a rolling hotel room, essentially. <laughs> you know, there's less room, less opportunity, yeah. more noise. You know, your schedule's intense. It's mm-hmm. yeah. That's why yeah. People ask me, you know, in our day job, like, oh, could you could you work on this in that month? No. No, I could say maybe, but the the real answer is no, because right. it's just too much. Um, well, twenty twenty, we're definitely. I think our number one focus is is just to to get on a schedule and make sure that you know we're coming out. I, I think you could call twenty nineteen our year zero. You know, we're yeah. it, it, going into it. We didn't really know what it was that we were doing, and, and we ultimately we we started to figure out. Oh, what this really is is that. You and I don't live in the same town anymore. We hate that. Um, and when we, you know, we're on Slack all day and whatever, we obviously we can call each other. But um, most of the time, our, you know, we're talking about business of some kind right. and taking doing doing our work. And we we this just became our opportunity to just hang out and and talk about whatever yeah. meditation or the Mandalorian or or whatever it may Toxic be. Toxic masculinity. Um, Talk, yeah, toxic masculinity. Um, so, <clears throat> so that's ultimately what it. And then we, you know, we'll have 
our good friend Allison on from time to time um, to kind of dive deeper into an, an, some different kind of nerdiness. But um, it, it, that's been the best part. It's just it, we've just been taking this time for ourselves. And it, there's work into it because, I mean, God knows, there's a million. Everyone and their sister and brother have a podcast there's a million yes. reasons for you to go listen to another podcast. <laughs> yeah. we're, we ultimately realize that we're not really doing this for you as much as for <laughs> ourselves. Right. And if we end up being mildly entertaining in the process, then then we're we're happy. Yeah. But um, if you're also bored, senseless, we're sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, anyways, so 2019, yeah. so th that's, that's, you know, I, I think we're just getting, we're just kind of, we're just kind of starting to understand what this is all about. And, um, from now on, we'll, I think we'll probably just be, you know, just do Like I said, do it more on a schedule and, um, see where it goes. And, but if nobody likes it, I, I still get to talk to you and, know. you know, and that's, that's the most important thing. Too. Um, yeah. Uh, is there so <clears throat> nerd stuff yeah. from 2019? Mm -hmm. I don't know if we just want to briefly cover what we liked or didn't like. Yeah, from last some, year mm -hmm. or, and or what we're looking forward to this year. Yes. Uh, yeah, I saw. You know, we have some talking points. I saw we had a couple of things that we shared. Disney Plus, Mandalorian seemed to top the list. Yeah. Um, have you, you finished it? You have finished it. I have. So I I, I have not because. I thought that it was so good. It was something that that Lindsay would enjoy. I kind of stopped, and now we're we're watching it together. And she does. She loves it. And she's not. She doesn't like Star Wars. She's not sci-fi. She, but she, said, without my saying anything, she said, "You know what I like about this? It's just simple." She's like, yeah. "I just don't know when I've yeah. seen something simple like this." Like, right, yeah. not just from Star Wars, right. but truly, like anything. just in the context of anything in pop culture recently. That yeah, that's a really great point. Yeah, um, and, and that's one of my favorite things too. I you know, the, I I think we're all exhausted from our disappointments and whatever from the Star Wars sagas. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, you could argue that you know, I I, I, I I oftentimes argue that Rogue One is the best Star Wars movie ever made. And it's a very simple plot, yes. right? I mean, it, it, it kind of dovetails into the rest of the saga, but it's, you know, it's kind of a dirty dozen story of mm -hmm. people on a mission and they complete their mission, sort of. And, um, and that's, that was so refreshing. And so to see them kind of dive even deeper into that and make something, it just feels like it has so much there's they're not afraid to just let it breathe and take it slow yeah. and god i just i love i really loved pretty i mean i don't i can't really think there was one episode that that um josh kaler and i were watched a couple episodes on the bus in december and there was one that he didn't like but i i thought it was fine yeah. um the one where he where he goes have you gotten to the one where he uh, yeah. kind of goes to the town and liberates the village right it's just um, a little cheesier a little bit. well yeah yeah i mean but I, I mean, whatever, I didn't care. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, I mean, there, there is something. Um, of course, the whole world is obsessed with Baby Yoda. But yes. um, it's weird to, like, be a part of that. You're experiencing it. And yet every time he comes on the screen, I still have this uncontrollable feeling of, oh, my God, there he is. Yeah, I know. <laughs> like, I know. He's doing something. He's doing something. He's a star. He's a true it's, celeb. It's freakish. It's yeah. freakish. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, Definitely top of the list, Diz Plus, uh, and I, I still have I've just kind of scratched the surface on Disney. I mean, I've been doing the the Marvel MCU uh, uh, chronological order watch, right? But um, although up to a point because they don't have Black Panther yet, I just discovered this today because what? I just got to Black Panther, and they don't they're, they're, it's, that's not going to be on Disney. I guess it's licensed on probably Netflix or something, oh. so they're not going to get it till March. Anyways, interesting. Uh, just word to the wise, if you're doing a chronological Marvel watch, uh, they don't have Black Panther yet. Um, what else? What else was good? Doom Patrol. Doom uh -huh. Patrol was great. Yes. Um, DC Universe for me overall, I'd say was disappointing. Um, yeah. I, I still read the comics. Um, I'm reading a little bit less comics maybe in general these days. Yeah. Uh, there's something, you know, they offer a lot. I, I don't, but I don't watch, I don't really use it that much for outside of reading the comics. I, 
uh, Titans, of course, was super, super dumb. I, yeah. I did end up finishing it. You did. Did I tell you this? Yeah, you did. Yes. I watched it. And it, there were there were episodes that, that got better. But overall, it was it devolved. Yeah. It's too bad. Yeah. It devolved into CW. Yeah. It should have been CW the second season, just should have. Yeah. Which is fine. Yeah. I will say that the Harley Quinn anima- uh, animated is really pretty fun. Uh, I don't know if I've it's heard a reason. It's good, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I don't know if it's. Lots of, it's lots, of, lots of blue language on that, yeah. too. Yeah. yeah. Why are they so. Why is DC so into. It's like they want to be the Rolling Stones to Marvel's. I Beatles, guess, but it right? doesn't. Like they want to, they want to be edgier yeah. and nastier. It doesn't come off that way, though. It it comes off as like, you know, oh, I mean, I, yes, I know that Harley Quinn would speak this way. I get it, but it's just more like, oh, you're trying to be edgy, and it, it is, it's awkward. It's awkward. It's unnecessary. Um, it's unnecessary. I mean, it seems even weirder in the context of a of a cartoon, of an animation, rather than. Like right, it seems like it makes a little bit more sense with Doom Patrol and uh, and Titans, which are yeah. you know, set in the quote real world, and you know they're just letting people speak like people. So, and from that perspective, it, it kind of it, it roots it a little bit more because they're just it sounds like normal modern day people speaking, right? right. You know, with who curse a lot, but yeah, I can see how that'd be even more jarring. Um, when it's a cartoon, a little bit. Uh-huh. I, th- I think the precedent is being set by by you know the kind of animation that uh, like BoJack Horseman and and you know the the very very adult cartoons that are out. But that feels very natural, whereas this uh, yeah just feels like yeah okay. they curse in BoJack Horseman and, and those those type of uh, cartoons. Yeah, they do actually. I, I'm okay. I'm trying to think. It, uh, it's probably so, not f bombs, right? Probably you not. Say, well, you could say, well, it's funny. Okay, so we watch uh, our new mindless, at least in our our new mindless show. We always have just a mindless show, whether it's Law and Order, SVU, because let's face it, who doesn't like rape, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, when we're not watching that, our new one is Suits, and Suits was a USA show, uh-huh. and they say shit. Okay. All the time. I mean, just just because they can say it, they right. say it, and they just like <laughs> constantly. Right. Um, but then we we we're also watched. So, but that's a cable show. But they did, but they never dropped the f bomb ever. Mm-hmm. Um, but then we've also been watching recently a show called You. Uh, right on Netflix. Yeah. Which is a Netflix show, but I think it was originally on Lifetime. Oh. And they're dropping f bombs and whatever. So I don't really know what the rules are for, say, Comedy Central and Adult Swim, like if they can say uh, F-bombs or uh, – I feel like whenever I've watched Rick and Morty, there's no cursing at all. Uh, um, but maybe Rick and Morty is – there are more kids who are into Rick and Morty than, than say, BoJack Horseman. I don't know. I don't know. Hard. Anyway, anyways, the point is it yeah. feels weird. Yeah, it feels, it feels weird. weird. I, haven't, I haven't seen the Harley thing yet. Um, it's fun. Overall, DC Universe. Okay. Eh. Uh, yeah. Watchmen, though. Watchmen. That I, I think that's probably the highlight of my my nerd year last year. I mean, it was just majest. The junk was majestic. The junk, the junk was majestic. It truly was. It was so well done. It was a it was a it was a surprise kind of for me. I really didn't I didn't expect it to be as good as it was. I didn't held up. It really held up. It it added to the uh, the milieu in, in such an interesting way. And then, you know, honestly, for the first at least solid third of it, it, it wasn't even in the realm, in my mind, of superhero fiction. And, and, and then, it, then it sort of became more so as, as the show went on. But, man, some of the, some of the, the filmmaking, the cinematography, the, just the unique stylized... I don't know the writing, the acting, just great, just really a winner. Yeah, loved it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, so while we're on this realm, uh, uh, Joker, I have to say, I know we had a discussion about it. You, you're, you may or may not see it, but man, 
Hey, he is so weird. He, I, we watched him on the Golden Globes the other day. He is so weird. God, he's yeah. weird. Oh, God, he's weird. Like, almost <laughs> off-putting weird, but he just, he took, he took me into a place. A scary mm-hmm. place, an uncomfortable place. Uh, but I was able to sort of view this movie, this very controversial, controversial movie, uh, as, as an art form in the end, try to strip away the implications or strip, strip away the, the politics. And it was damned good. It was really, really, really good. And I, uh, I'm glad I finally saw it. I'm, and I'm, I'm actually glad I did see it in the, in the theater because the, there were, there are a couple of sort of moments i don't i don't i'm hoping that they will translate to the smaller screen and I, i'm not talking about action there's no there's very little action but just the grandiosity of a big screen sometimes at a couple of these moments mm-hmm. i was like wow that was mm. just intense it's just so intense so i enjoyed joker uh not for the batmanness of it not for the dc the comicness of it just because it was a Scary ass movie. I keep calling it a horror movie. Um, I kind of a hold to that because there is definitely a a Hitchcockian psycho element to mm. not not Hitchcock, but just the concept of a man. I mean, there's so much acting. You know what I'm saying? There's so much acting mm-hmm. in this movie. More acting than mm. any you know branded superhero branded movie I've ever seen. So right. good, good for right. them. Uh, Let's see. Uh, I know you don't ha- haven't played many video games this year, but Red Dead Redemption was two was an enormous part of my life this year. Yeah, <laughs> We've never, I know. We, we I haven't know. really talked about it, but man, it is. It it really. I, I I started. I bought it last Christmas and 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 played through the story, and the story was beautiful. Beautiful, just really amazing, and then. Um, and then just because I didn't want to give up on the experience, I I started playing online, which is not is definitely not as rich, but it's it's fun in a very different way. And for the first time, I had a friend. I didn't have anybody to play with, so I would I was all alone in this world. And I was constantly being murdered. <laughs> so yesterday, finally for the first time, our, our our good friend Chris Slack created a posse, and 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 I got to join and. Sure enough, I walk into this this situation, and I'm just standing there, and someone shoots me through the head, and Chris had my back. <laughs> yeah, he had my back like that, man. He was just like, oh, really? Oh. And he just, it's great. It's great. So, But you still died. I still died. But then you, you respawn. It's not yeah. Yeah. in online. But it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a beautiful game. Uh, really, really great game. So that was, that's kind of... That's kind of a lot of the, my biggest ones. What else you got? Uh, you know, I went so I I went and had lunch um, with a couple of friends here who I know are are kind of gamer nerds, and um, I'm gonna try to. I think I'm gonna try to play D and D this year. What? Yeah. So one of the the first the first hurdle, of course. There's a, there's a it's few time. hurdles. Number one is is. Um, kind of refamiliarizing with D and D. It's yeah. been thirty years mm-hmm. at least since I've played it. I mean, I, hell knows. Um, you know, I you, I think I need to like read the current player handbook, which apparently is the closest. The fifth edition is the closest to what you and I grew up with. Right, I've heard that too. Um, so my friend Simon gave me a PDF of that. So I need to flip through that and go, okay, for, you know, s- refresh my memory. But but time is the biggest blocker because, yeah. you know, you and I growing up, we didn't, you know, you're kids. So you have all the time in the world to go out and buy a module and play a campaign and it can, you can play it every day or every weekend and make it last forever and, you know, whatever. Yeah. just didn't matter. Um, now we're going to try to start – apparently my, my other friend Nate, um, he – not Nathan Barris, sure. a, a different Nate, uh, has a – has some modules that are just one shots that you can, you can either finish in three to six hours, or if you want to get, you know, more detailed, you can make it last over two, you know, two sessions. That's nice. But, um, yeah, so I think we're going to try to do it. I've never, I haven't played, I'm a little bit kind of self-conscious about it. It's a, it's, it's, 
there's, I, there's, it's, I have such weird feelings because on one level I have such this deep, deep sense of, um, nostalgia. Yeah. Uh, and, and like connecting with a kind of childlike wonderment that we experience as kids when I feel like every, every kid who is into fantasy and science fiction and specifically role-playing games, that's, that's what the stuff that you fall in love with. Yeah. Right. Um, but then there's the culture around it, which can be very different. And I don't know what these people are like to play with. I, the only people I've ever played D and D with are you. And then my friends, um, Todd and his brother, Scott, uh, and our friend Darren. And then I, I think I played D and D weirdly. I ended up playing D and D with some kids in high school who were, or middle school even, who were like the popular kids and why on earth they invited me over to play D and D with them. Number one, what were they? They were like, yeah. you know, they, playing, were, they were athletes. <laughs> no, they were, they were, yes, they were like jocks. Satan loving athletes. I'm kidding. I mean, yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, maybe now they're deaf full on, they, they're murderers. <laughs> um, no, it was weird. They were like jocks, but they were into D and D. And I, I played with them once or twice, maybe. I, I don't even remember how that happened. But anyway, the the point is, for the most part, I've really only played with people that I knew pretty well. Um, and my friends Simon and, and Nate, like I, I don't, like I've said before, I, I don't have a ton of close friends here in Atlanta. I'm just such a miserable homebody that I don't get out. So this is part of me trying to push myself out into the Good. world. Yeah. Um, um, but I will also say, I'm, I'm just trying to, again, dovetail this into something else. Well, you were, you know, with Red Dead uh, Redemption 2 that you want me to get a copy of, which I will. Um, Nate also told me about a game called Divinity oh. uh, 2, um, which I'm going to slack to you right now. Um, he says, people say that this game is the closest for a video game. It's the closest to a paper role playing game that's ever that's ever been made. Like it's, really? yeah. So we should maybe look into this yeah. and see if this could be a thing for you and me. Um, and I also wanted to uh, put out there that we should probably maybe try to get um, Will Foy on the show to discuss games oh. um, because he is like his waters are very deep. He might a be someone fun to like, if we need an online community yes. for us to do this, he might be probably that guy. That's and, uh, and, and, or at the very least, you probably have some good ideas on what to do, where to start. Will Foy um, is a, is a, is a, actually a, a, chi a, a childhood school friend of ours that mm -hmm. uh mm -hmm. that we've st stayed in touch with over the years and a fan of the band and just an all-around phenomenal fella so that's a great yeah. idea that's a great idea we have goals another goal i love it will was will just as an aside will and i were on facebook uh kind of discussing the recent passing of neil peart which yes. you probably have heard of yes. um and uh since high school uh I'd say I'd say you you and Will were probably responsible for getting me interested in uh, REM, uh, but uh, I think Will was Will was maybe the I, maybe I could credit him with as the person who said like you need to check out this band, and then you were actually the person who gave me Reckoning. Okay. Um, I think that's how it played out. Anyway, but at the same time, Will was also like you've got to listen to Rush. You have to listen to Rush, and I just. I had a lifelong aversion. Like anytime I heard it, I just, I was like, no, I don't, I don't get it. This is not, you know, I, I, all of my friends growing up, all, all my D and D buddies essentially were into Guns N' Roses and Metallica and Halloween metal bands, like t the bands you listen to when you're playing D and D. <laughs> um, and meanwhile, I'm listening to talking heads and the Smiths. Oh, I'm cool. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I couldn't have listened to less cool bands in high school in North Carolina in the 1980s. But um, anyway, uh, Rush is probably the pen, the ultimate D&D &D band. Um, you know, you know, there, a lot of their lyrics draw on fantasy and sci-fi and stuff. But anyway, I never. I never really got into it. Um, I had a big problem with Getty Lee's voice, but just prog rock. I, I like songs that are, you know, short and I like a chorus, 
right? It just prog rock was never, doesn't matter, not just Rush, it's not my thing. But I had this, when I heard about him dying, I, I, I had the weirdest feeling. And I, maybe part of it was like some weird FOMO of, oh my God. I mean, Neil Peart has been legendary for decades, yeah. right? Yeah. Whether if you're, if you don't have to be a drummer to know who Neil Peart is, right? right? Um, and all of a sudden he was gone. And I was like, wow. And I, I've never given him the honor of even really checking out what he, what he did, what he was capable of. So I went down a YouTube rabbit hole the other night and just started looking at what he really could do. And it was, it was, I mean, there truly was, there, there was no, and probably never will be anyone like him wow. again. Um, and I, I, my, some of the favorite things that I saw were a couple of interviews and he, he didn't give many, he was very shy person. I mean, they're Canadian, right? So they're all apparently, they, I, th I think they're probably just genuinely great people. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> like not, not your average <laughs> rock star piece of crap. The Canadians, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but he was clearly extremely smart, very thoughtful. He wrote most of their lyrics. Oh, which I didn't. And he wrote, he wrote that. books. Yeah. He wrote books. Um, but n nobody, nobody has ever, I don't even think attempted what he did on the drum set. No one's ever come close to even trying. I mean, after he's done it, like, why would you, <laughs> um, no one, no, certainly no one was going to do it better than him. Wow. Um, so yeah, it's not, I mean, he was not, young. again, not, he was really young. He was. He was yeah. 67. Yeah, very young. He had brain cancer. He had kind of a tragic periods of his life. He lost his daughter to a drunk driver. Oof. He lost and his wife died a year later from um, cancer. Um, so he had some tough, he had some, dealt with some tough things. But um, anyway, yeah. uh, so we'll, yeah. we'll, I went back to Will to kind of make him a promise that I was going to try to make rush more of part of my life yeah. this year to just to honor, you know, like someone of that legendary status. It's just, even if you're not a fan, it's just, it just I, I was so surprised how affected I felt. Yeah. Um, so here, that's my promise. Will I'm going to listen to more rush this year. I promise. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll join. Rest in peace, Neil. Rest in peace. Neil. Yeah. Um, I feel I feel excited about this year. I have I'm really I really uh, I really want to get a lot done. I really want to get a lot done. I I feel like I got a lot done last year, and I I just want to continue that and and make it even stronger. And at the same time, if possible, I want to <laughs> relax more too. Isn't that weird? Like I want to. Yeah. I want to have more of a balance, I think, is what I'm asking for. I feel like yeah. I can. I feel like I can. Well, particularly for you, I mean, you you stretch yourself over a lot of things and a lot of things that don't necessarily always line your coffers the way that you would like. Right. Um, they're, they, you know, they, they tend to be time-consuming stuff and, and amazing, amazing stuff, like with Caption Point and, you know, things that have so much value. Yes. Um, but, uh, both for you personally, but also just for the world. Um, but, uh, it's not necessarily one of those things that you can automate and, yeah. and then, and then let go and they afford you the time to, to kick back. I want to line some coffers. I wouldn't mind lining some coffers with Bitbros. I think it would be, you yeah. know, talk about, you mean this show or our business? Or well, both? I mean, both, I feel like I feel like this could, I don't know, if, if when I visualize things and as part of my Miracle Morning, I definitely see how, wouldn't it be great if we could get a sponsor someday, you know? I, well, I mean, this year, let's just, let's just be, let's just be specific about it. Let's get, put it out into the universe. Let's put it out into the universe. Let's get a sponsor this year and, and, and enough people listening to this, this podcast about, I mean. Seinfeld did nine seasons of a, a show about nothing, and and we at least talk about, you know, being brothers, and and that's that's got to be interesting to somebody. So yeah, I think I think this year we could get a sponsor, and we could, um, you know, make a tiny bit of money to help pay for the time that it takes to put this together and stuff. 
That's a goal wonder. for me. I'd love that. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I like that goal. Okay. I like that goal. Let's do that. Maybe we'll let's let's figure out what it is people want to us to talk about that, other than ourselves. That helps. <laughs> <laughs> um, that helps. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we really would love it if people would 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 just sort of we start a uh, conversation with us. We we would love to know what you like and 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 what you don't and things that you turn off and turn and things that you you perk your ears at because we you know we're gonna do what we want to do as you mentioned earlier but but we do we do like having we do like having focus we do like doing this we like being connected to you listeners we like the concept of it uh so please let's let's hang out yeah we should get back on the discord yeah we should or or Discord. whatever the or, uh, yeah yeah we should get back on the. I just don't feel like people gave that a, a, a chance. I don't think they let it really stoke their nostalgia. Discord was it just was so old school. Yeah. I, I, I honestly I wanted to use it with dial up. <laughs> right, it just felt like the good old days. AOL. It really did. It really does. Anyway, yeah. AOL of twenty twenty. Let's bring it back. Um, Let's bring it back to 2020. I love yeah. you, brother. I love you too, brother. Uh, I'm glad um, to be back on the Bit Bros uh, podcast. Me too. Yeah. As always, this is brought to you by Bivens Brothers Creative. Yes. Um, Bivensbrothers.com. Uh, if you need a website, um, give us a shout. We, we like to build those things. We really do. Those are the things that we do. Yeah. Um, I think that's a wrap. Yeah, that's a wrap. Uh, until See next twenty twenty one. See you. <laughs> <laughs> see, see you in the uh, the early part of the twenty twenty. Uh, yeah, until next week. Okay. Come on in and have a good old time. Have the fun tonight.